Hi everyone, I'm Diane Brady. We're here talking about Nicola Sturgeon, who has announced her resignation as Scotland's first minister. Here's what she said. I get up in the morning and I tell myself, and usually I convince myself, that I've got what it takes to keep going and keep going and keep going, but then I realize that may not be true. I'm here with Maggie McGrath, um, editor of Forbes Women. Maggie, those are poignant words. Um, do we tend to hear them more from women or just interpret it differently than when it comes from a woman's mouth? You know, you asked me that question a little bit ago, and I've been looking for academic research on it, and I didn't immediately find it. But I have to say, anecdotally, it feels like we are hearing that more from women. I feel like if I were resigning, I'd be more likely to frame it in my emotional experience than perhaps if my brother were resigning. Mm -hmm. So anecdotally, I'm having trouble thinking of a man who stepped down from a CEO or presidential or leadership role using that language. We saw it just recently with Jacinda Ardern, right. uh, now former prime minister of New Zealand. That was also framed in a, I don't have any gas left in the tank type of way. Well, it's it's interesting because those are two cases of people who've also been vilified very publicly um, by opponents. You know, let's let's start with Nicola Sturgeon and and she was sort of at a low point politically in any case. I don't know if that's a factor here, but do you want to talk a bit about the swirl around her? So I'm not an expert in Scottish politics, but I have seen some rumblings and some polling around the Scottish National Party's popularity with voters. The FT reported that Scotland's voters prioritize health care and health services, but also doubted the SNP's ability to carry out their vision or desires in the health care space or in the health services space. Right. So that's a factor. Is it the primary reason? Who's to say what's in her heart? The other big factor we have seen is there was a proposed law in Scotland around gender identity. Mm -hmm. And this gets into the politics between Scotland and the British Parliament. And basically, the British Parliament, to my understanding, said, no, you can't do that. But it was around gender identity. And of course, that touches on a point that has become a bit of a culture war, you know, allowing someone to identify. I, Allowing someone to choose their gen gender identity on their identification is something that those on the more conservative side disagree with. And anyone who steps in that, we see a lot, whether it's here, whether it's in Europe, whether it's beyond, a lot of uh, fraught commentary around that. There's We discuss a lot about misogyny in terms of coverage. You know, we're talking here as the media and, and, and the type of coverage that women leaders have. I know it's something certainly we saw with Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand, um, a backlash against her. We've seen some of that, I think, with Nicola Sturgeon, certainly here in the U.S., Nancy Pelosi and others. I mean, is that is that changing or do you feel like are, are we still holding women especially in politics, to a different standard and type of coverage. It's interesting. I did find a study that indicated that it's different whether if it's a candidate versus an incumbent. Mm -hmm. We judge female candidates very harshly. Are they up for the job? They're battling a lot of cognitive biases on behalf of voters. because it's Including female voters? Including female voters, as we saw in 2016 here in the States. Uh, this study that I found showed that the effect diminishes when it's an incumbent. Mm -hmm. So once they've kind of already proven themselves for the job. However, this is a case of like you can find whatever evidence you need depending on where you look. We have also covered studies at Forbes that show that when women make mistakes, they are judged more harshly than men are when they make mistakes. Men are seen as unlucky when they make a mistake. Women are seen as, oh, it's your fault. Which you is why they don't always come back and bounce back to the same extent. I mean, I have to admit, I. I find it disheartening in, in some ways, and this may be generational, to hear uh, a woman leader stand up and cite burnout. And maybe that's something that they're normalizing it for the rest of us to do it. It does sort of raise the question of, are we giving fodder to people who think women can't take it in these roles or they can't take it for too long? I don't think so. I think they're showing a compassionate style of leadership. We, we also cover this at Forbes. Mm -hmm. Employees and voters, whether no matter which constituent group you're talking about, we want to see compassionate leaders. And I think two, three years into the pandemic, or we're officially in year three, Coming up, coming yeah, up, definitely. coming up is uh, the official three year anniversary. There's been a lot of talk about mental health. So I would like to think that women who stand up and say, I don't have anything left are empowering men to say the same thing, because 
Men are people too. Men can experience burnout. And if there is a male leader out there who feels like he does not have enough gas in the tank, maybe Nicola Sturgeon's speech will give a path to his own resignation and normalize it for all of us. I mean, we're looking at this through a gender lens. And I and I, I don't know if, if that I think that's fair, because I think that we're seeing a certain gender style here. I mean, in terms of the the style of how women quit. Uh, I know it's something you've looked at in the corporate realm. I don't know about the political realm, but there do seem to be similarities between what I hear from Hillary Clinton, Nicola Sturgeon, Jacinda Ardern. Um, I don't know if it's just about the personal or if it's something more that you've found. Well, I think it's interesting because you and I were talking about how men will often say, I'm stepping down to spend more time with my family. And Finally. We're, <laughs> and we're not hearing women say that. And I actually think if they were saying that, they'd get attacked even more. So in some ways, I think they're choosing the language that allows for less debate. Because I can't say how stressed or tired Nicola Sturgeon is. Only she can say that. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure political pundits will go after that. But I think if she were to say, I want to spend more time with my family, people could attack that and say, oh, see, women can't lead. They just want to spend time with their families. I mean, it's damned if you do, damned if you don't, kind of no matter what you do. But I actually think, again, we're in a moment where mental health is a huge conversation. Capacity and burnout are huge topics in the political and corporate spaces. So when you're drawing on language that reflects that, I think it makes you a good leader, frankly. How much is gender part of the debate right now? Let's come back to the U.S. We're seeing um, new candidates step up. Nikki Haley stepped up to announce that she's going to be trying to be the GOP candidate for the president. Do you feel like it's playing out differently now than it did even, say, when Hillary Clinton was running? No. No. Same, same different. Is it more exacerbated now? Maybe I'm just not optimistic, but I have... I think the 2016 election, the way we saw voters break, I, I still think we have a long way to go before voters see the two genders as equal, unfortunately. And interestingly, um, neither of these, uh, you know, in Jacinda Ardern's case, she's back to being an MP, Nicola Sturgeon, I'm not sure, but they don't necessarily disappear from the scene. They're just basically saying, I don't want the leadership role anymore. Right. I think I saw something that said Nicholas Sturgeon's going to be in politics through 2026, mm -hmm. if, if my facts are correct there. So, but the spotlight isn't as harsh, right? Yeah. When you are the one at the lectern in the press conference, that's a different type of pressure than if you are part of a peer group. And it's lonely at the top, right? No. I can't blame her for, you know, she had a good run. She had eight she years. Had eight years. Yeah. And, and I suppose it's good to normalize these different means of quitting. Right. I think it's good not to have the um, more time with family and to talk about some of the personal stresses of the job, because I think they are under scrutiny. You know, I was talking with a source yesterday who said this was just her personal opinion, but she believes that the capacity to make change in a role taps out after eight to 10 years. Oh. After eight to 10 years in the same job, her experience, she worked in city politics uh, in New York City and is involved in some UN jobs. Based on what she has seen in her space, I want to be very clear, that's her unique view. Mm -hmm. But I think it's that was a really interesting comment. She really identified that eight to 10 year span. Here in the States, it's we have term limits mm -hmm. So for president. Not for senators. Not for senators, as we know. Or, or uh, Supreme Court justices. But I think there's something to that. And I don't necessarily, again, know everything that's on Nicola Sturgeon's mind. But eight years to me feels like a complete run. And I think it's good to normalize that versus staying well past the point of effectiveness. Yeah, very true. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.